just imagine. We're flying 2,000 miles in just four and a half hours. Yes, Jeffrey, modern travel is truly amazing. I'd say amazingly fast. That too, much faster than just 175 years ago. Why, did you know that traveling 2,000 miles in those days would take not four and a half hours, but four and a half months, sometimes even longer? How were they able to do that, Mr. Beanbody? I mean, they didn't have highways with nearby motels or restaurants, did they? Oh, certainly not. As to how they did it, what do you say we use my Go Back app to find out? Gosh, Mr. Beanbody, where the heck are we? And what year is it anyway? Well, according to this map, we're in Independence, Missouri. And from the look of things, I'd say it's the mid-1840s or early 1850s. Why Independence? And why in those years, Mr. Beanbody? Well, Lily, Independence was where thousands of people began their trip westward in the mid-19th century. A time when almost half a million Americans decided to start a new life in the West. Wow. Why so many, Mr. Beanbody? There were several reasons, Jeffrey. First, hard times. Many people lost their jobs during a very bad depression in the late 1830s and 1840s and were looking for a place where they could earn a living. Second, many cities in the East were overcrowded. And third, Western lands were inexpensive. Finally, farmland in the West was excellent, much better than in other places. Anyway, there were other jumping-off places besides Independence, such as St. Joseph, Missouri, and Council Bluffs, Iowa. But Independence was the most widely used for those traveling on the Santa Fe Trail, the California Trail, and the Oregon Trail, three of the four major routes for pioneers heading west. So, did they just start walking from there? Oh, no, Lily. There was a lot of preparation that had to be done. First, the travelers, called overlanders, needed a covered wagon. It carried everything they'd need on the trip. And not just any wagon would do. It had to be light, yet very strong to travel across unpaved trails and rocky terrain. In addition, it had to ford or cross rivers. And then there was the canvas cover, waterproof with linseed oil. The cover protected everything inside the wagon when it rained. When seen at a distance, the covers looked somewhat like sails on a ship, so the wagons were called prairie schooners. A schooner was a 19th century ship with sails. Now, as soon as travelers bought a wagon, they needed to buy some animals to pull it. And that usually meant oxen. Although mules or horses were sometimes used, oxen were very strong. They wouldn't wander off at night, and they were very difficult to steal. So they were pretty much ideal. Pioneers needed to buy a yoke, too, so the animals could work together as a team when pulling the wagon. Hmm, there sure was a lot of things to buy, Mr. Beanbody. Believe it or not, Jeffrey, there were many other things to purchase. To find out exactly what, let's go to a general <coughs> store, where pioneers bought many necessities for their journey. Well, sir, you're going to need a rifle and, of course, uh, ammunition for hunting and protection. Then you'll need some of your household items for eating and cooking. Then there's your tools to fix the wagon wheels and axles, because they're probably going to break. And the missus is going to want some sewing things. Uh, this here medicine will come in handy, and here are some other necessaries. Of course, food was vital. Flour, eggs, cornmeal, coffee, beans, a kind of cracker called hardtack, slabs of bacon, and dried meat called jerky. A barrel to hold water was another must-have item. Guidebooks were very important, too. Travelers used them to make certain they wouldn't get lost. They were written by people who had already made the trip. Did everybody use those guidebooks, Mr. Beanbody? No, not everybody, Lily. Sometimes pioneers hired trail guides, men who hunted and trapped in the areas where the travelers would be going. I want to assure you all that I've traveled on our route, the Oregon Trail, many times. So I know it well. Now, as most of you probably know, a wagon train this size will need a captain. 
So before we begin, in two days, if the weather's good, y'all should get together and elect one. Now, your captain will be the boss. He will decide when and where we will stop at midday and at night, depending on the information I give him, of course. He and the lieutenants he chooses will settle any arguments. Now, let's move ahead several weeks at four in the morning. At that dreadful hour, a whistle was blown or a bugle sounded to wake up the travelers who would begin gathering the livestock. For protection, all the wagons had been pulled into a circle the night before. Several night watchmen were posted. Now, as soon as they dressed, some children would milk their family's cows. Some of the milk would be drunk at breakfast. Some would be used to make butter, and the rest would be used for food preparation. An example would be making a skillet cornbread called Johnny Cake. Other common breakfast foods were beans and meat, all washed down with hot coffee. After breakfast, the overlanders sorted out their cattle, untied their horses, and the animals were tied to sticks to keep them from running off, and yoked up their oxen. Roll the wagons! Roll them out! At seven sharp, the wagons headed out. Most people walked because riding in the wagon could be very unpleasant. That's because the trail was usually rutted and bumpy, and wagons had no springs to cushion the jolts. During the day, some men would go out hunting until they reached buffalo country. They scouted for small game, prairie chickens, pheasants, and rabbits. During the day, children might head out from the wagons to look for wild berries. It was a good way to relieve the boredom. Did the wagon train travel all day, Mr. Beanbody? Not all day, Jeffrey. After five hours, the travelers stopped for a meal, sometimes called noon dinner. It almost always consisted of breakfast leftovers. The midday stop, called nooning, was a time to rest the animals and give them a chance to graze. For some overlanders, nooning was nap time. If they weren't sleeping, travelers might write in their diaries. Children sometimes visited friends at another wagon to play games or just talk. Once in a while, a spelling or arithmetic bee would be held. After the nooning stopover, it was time to hit the trail once again. Day after day of walking? That had to be so boring. Well, not always, Lily. There were plenty of interesting sights along the way such as prairie dogs, as well as complete prairie dog towns, which were quite a sight. Other animals encountered were porcupines, rabbits, skunks, bears, and thousands upon thousands of buffalo. And there were famous landmarks. When pioneers reached one, such as Chimney Rock in today's Nebraska, they knew how far they had traveled. But forts were the most exciting places on the way. They were strung all along the trails heading west. Pioneers were always happy to reach a fort because they could buy supplies they had run out of, and often nearby they could trade with natives, perhaps cloth for vegetables, fish hooks for fur, or beads for meat. Moccasins were a popular trade item because overlanders' shoes often wore out from so much walking. Except for trading and offering trail information, Indians paid little attention to the overlanders from the early 1840s to the early 1850s. However, things changed in the mid and late 1850s after a series of misunderstandings and after some soldiers killed a Lakota Sioux chief, conquering bear. Even so, there was much less conflict between natives and overlanders than most people think. But there were still many other dangers, as well as mishaps and hardships. One of the dangers was river crossings. Wagon trains followed the rivers for much of the journey. Rivers provided water and nearby grass for the animals. But wagons were top-heavy and sometimes tipped over after hitting a large rock. Occasionally, overlanders and oxen would drown in the accident. Quicksand in rivers was another danger. To avoid tip-overs in quicksand, overlanders sometimes loaded their wagons on ferries operated by businessmen or natives. But ferries were expensive and very slow. It often took several days for all the wagons in a long wagon train 
to cross the river. So sometimes overlanders applied caulking to waterproof their wagons and just hoped for the best. Gee, Mr. Beanbody, did the pioneers do anything else to get their wagons through unsafe areas? Indeed they did, Jeffrey. Now, let's move ahead several months when the trail wound its way through the Rocky Mountains, which could be dangerously steep and in places impossible for a fully loaded wagon to make any headway. At those locations, the wagon's contents had to be set aside to lighten the load. Then several ox teams or more would be combined to haul up the wagon. To go down, the wagon wheels sometimes would be chained or locked with long branches between the spokes so they could slowly skid down the incline. Another way to go downhill used horses and long ropes tied to the back of the wagon. As the horses slowly walked forward, the wagon was gently lowered. But occasionally the ropes would break and the wagon would tumble down the mountain and crash. Those below could be seriously injured or even killed. Gee, Mr. Beanbody, it could be really dangerous being a pioneer traveling west. Yes, that's right, Lily. In fact, one out of ten overlanders never made it to his or her destination. Children fell out of wagons, and diseases such as measles, typhoid, dysentery, cholera, and mountain fever took many lives. And a wagon train could be caught in mountain snows if it left too late in the year or moved too slowly. That's what happened to a famous group, the Donner Party, during the winter of 1846-47. When a rescue party finally reached them in April 1847, only 47 of the original group of 81 had survived. Ah, but fortunately the weather this evening is perfect. Not a snowflake or cloud in sight. At about six o'clock, the day would wind down. If the wagon train was in buffalo country, children would gather buffalo chips or dried buffalo droppings, which made excellent smokeless fuel. And if the hunters were successful, dinner was often buffalo meat, along with gravy, cornbread, and beans. While dinner was being cooked, the animals were watered. And the captain assigned men to nighttime guard duty. After dinner, the overlanders might dance or simply listen to music. Young children slept with their parents in a wagon, while everyone else slept in tents, or underneath their wagon, or out in the open beneath the stars. If it rained, everybody crowded into the wagon, or if there was no room there, they would spend a sleepless night in the mud beneath the wagon. Finally, after four and a half or five months, the overlanders reached their destination. The first thing they did was unload their belongings and set up a permanent camp. And then within a day or so, they would begin building rough cabins. Neighbors almost always helped. Gosh, Mr. Beanbody, the overlanders' journey was really hard. Yes, Jeffrey, it was. There were many dangers. But there were fascinating sights along the way. And despite the boredom and all the hardships and dangers, the pioneers took to the trail to find what they hoped would be a new and wonderful life far to the west. <laughs>